Right in front of you are five of the oldest, and honestly, maybe the worst, GPUs ever made, from very old to ancient. Most of these graphics cards are over 10 years old, and somehow you can still find and buy them today. But just because they're old doesn't mean I'm going to go easy on them. Today we're putting these relics to the test by running modern games, even AAA titles. No mercy, no excuses. So the real question is, how bad is it really I... And do any of these ancient GPUs still have a fight left in them? Let's find out. Let's start with the first GPU, the AMD Radeon R5 340, released back in 2015. It's part of the Radeon 300 series, but way down at the bottom of the lineup. No R7, no R9, no RX branding here. And honestly, the name alone kind of tells you its reputation. This was never a WOW card. That said, at launch it wasn't terrible. It was budget-friendly, reasonably efficient, and for its class the performance was acceptable. You're getting 384 shader cores, and more importantly, DirectX 11 support, which at least gives it a fighting chance with some modern games. At first glance, the PCIe fingers look like they're missing some contacts, but don't worry, that's actually how it's designed. So, let's see what it can actually do, before throwing it straight into my main PC, because plugging random old GPU into your daily system is always a gamble. I tested it on a spare setup first. Better safe than killing a perfectly good motherboard. Good news, it posted. We have display. With that out of the way, I moved it into the main machine. First step, DDU. I wiped all old drivers to avoid conflicts, because the last thing I want is a driver mess, or worse, a blue screen mid-test. After installing fresh drivers and checking GPU Z, everything looks correct. Fire 5 340, 2 GB DDR, 3 V RAM. One more weird detail popped up. This GPU is running at 900 MHz. That's way higher than it should be. For reference, the standard R5340 only clocks at 730 MHz by default. So seeing 900 MHz strongly suggests this might actually be an R5340X, not the regular 340. Before jumping into the game test, let's quickly run Heaven Benchmark and see what this thing can do. And yeah, it's rough. At 1080p medium settings, the average FPS sits at around 6.5, with peaks barely hitting 13.9 FPS. Those numbers are already bad on their own, and if this is the benchmark result, you can probably guess how gaming is going to go. Now the real question is the one that actually matters. Can this thing run Minecraft? And more importantly, can it handle shaders? Let's find out. I'll start with the absolute minimum settings. Two chunks at full HD. Surprisingly, the FPS isn't bad at all. It shoots up to around 140 FPS. When I move into a forest, it drops to about 110, with a bit less stability, but still totally playable. Next, I bump the render distance to 8 chunks, and honestly, it still feels smooth and easy to play. No real complaints there. Then I push it all the way to 32 chunks. That's where things start to fall apart. FPS drops to around 30, which is way below the ideal 60 and definitely noticeable. Now for the real stress test, shaders. I'm using Bliss. At minimum render distance, performance absolutely collapses, around 3 frames per second. That's basically unplayable. I drop the resolution to 720p and it barely helps, hovering around 7 FPS. Even at the lowest possible settings, it only climbs to about 12 FPS. Technically smoother than before, but yeah, still pretty rough. In CS2, this GPU manages around 25 frames per second at full HD. Drop the resolution to 720p, and it can climb to about 40 frames per second. Is it ideal? Not even close. But honestly, hitting 40 FPS like this is something a lot of gamers would have dreamed of 10 years ago. And that alone says a lot about how far hardware has come. Moving on to a AAA title like Tomb Raider. This game is fairly GPU heavy, so I kept expectations realistic. 720p resolution, lowest settings. And honestly, it holds up better than expected. Average FPS sits around 50 to 60, staying pretty close to the 60 FPS mark, which actually feels smooth on a standard 60 Hz monitor. There's basically no headroom for higher settings, but for an older AAA title like Tomb Raider, 720p low is the sweet spot where this GPU can still deliver a playable, consistent experience. Now for the final boss, Cyberpunk 2077. This is where the limits become very clear. At 720p, the GPU struggles to push more than 15 FPS, and it even has to borrow up to 2GB of system RAM just to load the game assets. 
Dropping the resolution even further only gains a few extra frames. Nothing meaningful. At that point, it's clearly hitting a hard wall. That said, after testing performance and looking back at the price of this GPU, my perspective has changed a bit. It's not just a display adapter, it actually handles light games like Minecraft and a handful of older titles reasonably well. As long as expectations are kept in check, it does more than just put out a signal. The second card probably looks familiar because it's one of the five broken GPUs I bought earlier. Surprisingly, it's still in decent shape, so I decided to bring it back for this video. This is the AMD HD 7750, the 2GB DDR3 version. Even though it came out all the way back in 2012, it's noticeably stronger than the R5 340. In benchmarks, it scores about 42% higher. It has more compute units, 512 versus 384, and double the memory bandwidth with a 128-bit bus instead of 64-bit. It was considered a mid-range card back in the day, and honestly, the performance still isn't terrible, so let's skip the talking and jump straight into the test to see how it actually holds up. It's still not great, but compared to the R5 340, it's a noticeable step up. At 1080p medium settings, it averages 14.8 FPS, with dips to 8.9 FPS and peaks around 26.5 FPS. So yeah, 1080p medium is still rough, but at least it's no longer a complete slideshow like the R5340. And yeah, the results line up exactly with what you'd expect. This GPU is clearly a step up from the previous one. At two chunks, FPS jumps way ahead. We're talking roughly 90 to 100 FPS higher than the card before it. Bumping the render distance to eight chunks, it still holds around 150 frames per second, which honestly feels pretty solid. Even at 32 chunks, this card is still playable. No slideshow, no panic. But shaders? Yeah, that's where reality hits. At 32 chunks with shaders, FPS drops straight down to about 7 FPS. And weirdly enough, even when I lower it to 8 chunks, performance barely improves at all. That tells me the GPU is already completely tapped out. At that point, I could keep lowering settings like I did with the previous card, but let's be real, the ending wouldn't change much. So instead of torturing it further, I'm calling it here and moving on to the next game. I'm getting around 40 FPS at full HD and GTA 5 with this card. And honestly, it's playable without too much struggle. If you want smoother gameplay, dropping the resolution to 720p gives you a nice FPS boost. Moving on to something faster paced like CS2, at 1080p this GPU still manages about 45 FPS, which is roughly 20 FPS higher than the previous card. Lower it to 720p and it gets close to that sweet 60 FPS mark. If you're new to the game or just playing casually, that's not a bad experience at all. Next up is a classic AAA title, The Witcher 3. At 720p, it holds around 25 FPS. It's not silky smooth, but for a story-driven game like this, it's just about enough to get through and enjoy the world. And then there's the game every week GPU fears, Cyberpunk 2077. At 720p, this card delivers roughly 25 FPS. I won't pretend that's good, discuss, but if you're a diehard cyberpunk fan, it's still technically playable. And considering this GPU costs less than half the price of the game itself, that's kind of impressive in its own weird way. Finally, Tomb Raider. At 720p, it hits around 90 FPS, which is surprisingly strong. For a GPU that costs about 20 bucks, this is honestly one of the most bare minimum but workable options you can pick for a super low budget PC. The third card is also from Team Red and it's a name you might not expect in a gaming test. The AMD Fire Pro V3900, released back in 2012. Just looking at it instantly brings back memories of early 2010s, architecture, construction, and mechanical engineering students. Back then, the V3900 was an entry ticket into the world of professional graphics. This was never meant to be a gaming card. Its real strength lies in stability and precision, the kind you need for CAD, 3D modeling, and design work. Ironically, despite that serious mission, the card itself is very plain. No flashy cooler, no aggressive design, just pure function over form. So the big question is, how does a workstation GPU like this handle modern games? That's exactly what I'm about to find out for you. After checking GPU-Z, it's confirmed. This is the FirePro V3900, packing one gigabyte of DDR3 VRAM and a very modest 480 cores. 
same benchmark, same story. It averages around 11 FPS, with peaks topping out at 21.7 FPS. With numbers like that, there's basically zero chance it beats the second card. But honestly, I still want to throw it in some real games and watch it suffer. The first game is still Minecraft. Honestly, not bad at all. At two chunks, I'm at seeing around 150 FPS. Crank it up to 32 chunks, and FPS drops pretty hard, down to about 25, with occasional spikes up to 40 if nothing crazy is happening. Now shaders, yeah, that's where reality hits. I had to turn everything down to the lowest settings, and even then it's only about 10 FPS. It genuinely feels like I just time-traveled back to how gaming was 10 years ago. Nostalgic, but not exactly smooth. In CS2 at 720p, this card barely manages around 30 FPS. Even after lowering the settings, it's still not stable enough to actually play. This is more of a test run than a real CS2 experience. Definitely not ideal for any kind of competitive FPS. Moving on to The Witcher 3, the hardware limits become even more obvious. Real-world performance sits at around 16 frames per second, even after dropping to a very low 4-3 to 3 resolution. At that point, it's not really playable. More like a quick experiment. Bottom line, the Fire Pro Vi 3900 just isn't a viable choice if you want a stable Witcher 3 experience. Now, Tomb Raider at 720p tells a much nicer story. Here, the card actually hits a solid 60 FPS, which is honestly impressive compared to the previous test. This is a great example of a well-optimized older AAA game where legacy hardware can still deliver a smooth experience. But in a completely different league, Cyberpunk 2077 is where this GPU completely taps out. The game repeatedly crashes on launch, and I can't even get into gameplay. The fourth GPU is the GT 521GB DDR3, released back in 2011. A card that earned itself a pretty brutal but very accurate nickname, the Display Output Legend. I'm not even trying to roast it here, but let's be honest. When the GT 520 launched, people complained a lot, and for good reason. Its gaming performance was extremely weak. I know I shouldn't expect much from it, but honestly, that just makes me even more curious. Let's see just how bad it really is. Getting this GPU up and running was way harder than it should have been, mainly because finding the right driver was a nightmare. After double-checking in GPU-Z, things started to look… suspicious. Turns out this is actually a fake card. The real GPU underneath is GT218, a legit chip, but one that normally belongs to ultra-low-end cards like the GeForce 210. Here's the giveaway. The system reports 96 unified shaders, but GT218 physically only has 16 shaders. That mismatch is a huge red flag. So what I'm really testing here isn't what the label claims. It's basically a rebranded GeForce 210, or something very close to it, pretending to be something better. Now that we know what this thing actually is, let's see how bad the real-world performance gets. When I dropped it into my main test system, that's when the problem started. No display at all. Turns out some really old GPUs just won't work unless the system is set to legacy boot. So I threw together a more compatible test rig, switched the boot mode, and finally the card came to life. In Minecraft, it actually holds around 60 FPS when flying up high and looking down, and about 90 FPS during normal movement. But that's at 720p with very low view distance. Once I bumped it up to 8 chunks, performance fell off hard, dropping to roughly 30 FPS. In Tomb Raider at 720p, performance completely falls apart. FPS barely cracks 10, and the stuttering is constant. Unless you're extremely patient, this is one GPU you should stay far away from. I also tried a few other games, but that's where things got even worse. The card runs into DirectX issues and simply refuses to launch several titles. On paper, a real GT520 supports DX11, which means it should be able to run these games. But here's the catch, this isn't a real GT520. It's a fake card, and in reality, it's basically a GT210, or possibly even worse. And finally, the final boss of this lineup, the most unfortunate character of them all, the GT210. The version I'm testing here comes with 512 megabytes of DDR3V RAM, and at this point, I really don't need to explain much more. Just hearing GT210 already tells you everything you need to know about where this is going. So instead of talking about it any longer, let's power it on and see what reality looks like. This card only supports DirectX 10, so I'm limited to older games. For League of Legends at 1080p, low settings, it sits around 30 FPS, 
and even during team fights it doesn't drop much, which is honestly better than I expected. In Minecraft, with the render distance set to 8 chunks, performance is a lot tighter, hovering around 33 frames per second. Playable, sure, but you can definitely feel the limits of the hardware here. And with that, we've finally reached the end of the video. I'll be honest, this one was way more work than it looks. Hunting down drivers for these old GPUs, getting them to install, fixing random issues. It was slow, painful, and sometimes straight up annoying. So here's my honest advice. If you're planning to buy a GPU to actually play games today, save your money and go for something newer. Your time, sanity, and experience will be much better for it. As for buying ancient GPUs just to mess around like I did, hey, that's on you. Thanks a lot for watching all the way to the end. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.